We're delighted to have Hank Green with us here today. Uh, Hank is uh, a graduate of the University of Florida, and anthropology probably, if you work with Russ Bernard down there, those of you who know the work, uh, Russ's work over the years, uh, certainly his early network work with uh, uh, uh on network accuracy. Uh, you know who uh, Russ Bernard is. After he graduated from there, he went to the University of Illinois, the same time that Andre Hollingshead was there. I uh, went there on an NIA, NIMH uh, postdoc uh, research appointment for two years, working with Stan Wasserman. And uh, I don't know the other person you work with. Larry Huber. Larry Huber. Uh, and then after he finished that, he went to Northwestern University and spent two years there uh, with Nash Contractor, who everybody here probably knows. Uh, yes, now you're beginning to make the connection. <laughs> yeah. <right>. Yes. <laughs> okay. And for the last two years, he's been at Brand Corporation here in Santa Monica, uh, working on a variety of different research projects that I think uh, he's going to talk, talk about several of them today, blend them all together. And so uh, without further ado, uh, let's give a nice warm welcome, uh, and, and welcome, I should say, since this is sponsored by the Annenberg Networks Network, to Hank Green. Um, so, first, it's, it's my great pleasure to be able to come and speak to you guys today. One of the things that we don't get a chance to do very much at RAND is to talk about um, how we develop our ideas and sort of how we sort of build the theoretical models and, and sort of frameworks that we use to, 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 it, to design and implement the studies that we do. RAND stuff because it's got such a policy perspective and RAND Health in general because it's so intervention focused. Usually when they ask us to give a talk, it's, it's very much associated with tell us the research design, tell us the results, tell us how you built the intervention, tell us whether or not the intervention worked, right? So it's nice for me to be able to actually talk with some people uh, to, to explain how we've been using these empirical findings to build this new conceptual model that we're thinking about and that we're going to be able to test with this new study that we're, that we're putting into the field in Uganda in September. So. Um, I, I really don't stand on formality, so if you guys have questions, please interrupt me and ask me questions because I'd rather sort of do this in a dialogue with you than stand in front of you and, and sort of bark at you all of, the, all of the information, right? I think it would be so much more exciting if you guys are asking the questions about what's going on when you have them rather than sort of sitting there quietly. Um, most of the work that I, just to give you a general idea of the kind of stuff that I do at RAND, most of the work that I do focuses on networks and how networks affect individuals' behaviors and attitudes and vice versa, right? So I'm sort of looking at co-evolutionary models of networks and, and health-related behaviors. Um, one main group of studies work is focusing on the homeless in Los Angeles. So we've done a study of homeless women. Uh, we're concluding a study of homeless youth and adolescents, um, which has been really, really, really interesting. And um, we're sort of ramping up a study of homeless men here in the Los Angeles area. And we're going out and we're collecting uh, personal network data from these individuals. So we ask them to tell us their cognitive personal networks. And then we're investigating how those cognitive social networks are affecting their behaviors, their health behaviors, mostly associated with sexual and uh, substance use, sexual risk and substance use. So that's one group. Um, a second group of studies is, is sort of based largely in uh, analysis of the ad health study data. So we're looking at complete networks um, of adolescents over time and investigating how those networks affect their substance use behaviors mostly. So we've got a smoking study, we've got a drinking study, we're going to look at risky sex coming up here soon, um, and substance use. And then the third group of studies, which is sort of what I'm going to be talking about today, are studies of HIV care adherence in Uganda and how personal networks affect care adherence and long-term health outcomes. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Peter said I also won the distinction of the longest uh, talk title um, <laughs> of anyone. At the, I, I guess I put on my anthropologist hat. There's a colon, there's lots of words. I was going to add some quotation marks and some parentheses, but I decided I was, I'll just leave it at that. 
Um, but the, the idea was I couldn't come up with a cute way to talk about what we believe is sort of a kind of complicated theoretical model that is looking at the intersection of disclosure of HIV status uh, stigma and discrimination in a country where HIV and homosexuality are incredibly stigmatized, social support, and these, these sort of health outcomes, all of which we think are sort of um, operating through the nexus of these, individual, in the, these individuals' personal networks, right? So what's going on? Obviously, we know that the AIDS epidemic continues to be a problem in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly you know, including Uganda. Um, at the last measure, which was, I think, in 2008, they, they had noted that over a million Ugandans were HIV infected with a prevalence rate sort of holding steady at about 7%, right? So we're not seeing any decreases in prevalence of HIV, right? Um, ART scale-up has done well. 30% of those needing ARV um, getting treatment, um, and while medication adherence has been good, what we're finding is that we have care attrition. So over the course of time, people are sort of dropping out of care. They're coming to their they're coming to their doctor's visits for a while, and then ultimately not not staying. So we're not seeing them come back over time, right? And that has a significant effect on the effectiveness of ART, right? Can you say what ART is? Anti antiretroviral treatment. So basically, um, PEPFAR, which is the President's Fund for AIDS Research in Africa, provides funding to purchase <coughs> medicine, antiretroviral treatment for people living in Africa. That money also pays for clinical support and medical treatment there. So the funding goes to Africa, the funding goes to support specific clinics around Africa who have been awarded the funding, and that's, that is also used to pay for the medications and also all of the sort of associated corollary treatments. Yeah. I have a question about how um, incidence has changed over time. I mean, you said that it's been pretty stable at 7%. Mm -hmm. What has it changed in terms of who is being diagnosed with HIV in terms of, you know, more females now, younger, or, you know? Is there any, any change in... And also in terms of testing? You mean in terms of who's getting tested? Yeah, so who's getting, who, who, yeah, who's getting infected and who's, who's what getting do I, What do I know about the changing of the, the, of the demographics here in terms of the incident? <coughs> um, we know, obviously, that over time, more children are being diagnosed with HIV. Mm -hmm. um, women are far more likely to be diagnosed than men are, mostly just because they see the doctor more often, because they go see the doctor when they become pregnant and usually they are tested then. Men, mm -hmm. on the other hand, are not. Right. So it's unlikely that men find out that they're positive until they have a wife who okay. comes back and says, I'm HIV positive. Mm -hmm. um, this is problematic also because men in Uganda, though this is not really sort of popularly reported, men in Uganda often have multiple wives and multiple families in different locations. So a man can find out that he's positive because one wife comes back and tells him he's positive and then not tell any of the three or four other wives and choose to sort of selectively inform his spouses. Even though he's in a long-term stable monogamous relationship with these women, he can still not inform them of their of the likelihood that they've been affected by HIV, right? Which is disappointing. So we know that the population is lo of, in of HIV uh, infected individuals in care is largely women mostly because they're the ones who are finding out. Um, and I think that's probably been pretty much the same over time. Um, so what happens if you're not adherent? Obviously, if you're not in care, you're, if you're in and out of care, if you're going sometimes, you're not going sometimes, you're taking your medicine infrequently, you're not going to have the best health outcomes. Just That's the bottom line. right? Ultimately, poor health outcomes are going to lead to Isolation, job loss, depression, all this whole sort of constellation of things that are associated with poor chronic health. Um, just to situate you, Uganda is here right at the edge of Lake Victoria, surrounded by the Sudan, Kenya, Tanzania. Um, this over here is the Congo, and this is Rwanda down below there. Right? Let me see if I'm right, because the next, yeah. So down here is where the gorillas are. 
and up there is where the lions and the giraffes are, mostly. Mm -hmm. right. um, this is the beginning, this Lake Albert, this is the beginning of the Nile, right? The Blue Nile starts there. So just to give you an idea of where we're looking. Mm -hmm. Up here is pretty dry. Equator runs right about here. So we've got pretty much constant, you don't have seasons, you've just got rainy and dry, right? More arid to the north, and then down here it's pretty lush and tropical. So non-adherence, one of the major reasons people are not adherent is because of the stigma associated with disclosing your HIV status, right? Um, and we know that for many people, the fear of being identified um, encourage, doesn't <coughs> encourages people not to tell their partners, encourages them not to tell their family members, discourages them from getting treated, right? Discourages them for if they are positive from going in to get um, medical care, I mean, getting tested, and discourages them from getting treated. All of these things, as a as a sim, as a sort of syndrome, cause problems. Is the discouragement of getting treated because there's the treatment involves some kind of evidence that you are um, infected. In other words, like you would have pills or yeah. be something that people yeah. can see. It's not right. just a psychological, if I don't admit that I have it, then. No, there are actually, I mean, because you have to take medications on a fairly regular basis, ultimately you're going to have to tell someone, or someone's going to know they're going to see positive, you. right? So you will end up passively disclosing your HIV status to someone because you have to take this medication regularly, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about disclosure later on in the talk, too. Um, so in, in case you don't think that this is a problem, I don't know if you have heard on the news about this Uganda anti-homosexuality bill, right? That could make it a capital offense if they find out that you've been having gay sex. Um, it could effectively stop all um, HIV treatment in the country because that's considered promoting homosexuality. Um, there's so little understanding that the large majority of HIV positive individuals are actually heterosexual in Uganda. But there's a, this fear, there's this culture of fear that's going on that's causing serious problems, right? So if you disclosing your HIV status ultimately could lead to the death penalty, probably some serious problems with encouraging people to disclose their HIV status, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. um, and the fact that if you know of homosexuality or homosexual activity and you don't tell it, you could also be charged with a crime is pretty outrageous. But, so this is, the, this is the current sort of social situation that's going on, right? So in general, people understand stigma from two different ways, right? There's a sociocognitive idea, which is that stigma is an internalized and individual feeling that's unrelated to anything other than what you've learned and how you feel about how you might be perceived, right? Um, so your cognition ultimately affects your behavior. Uh, anthropologists have a sort of more structural approach, which is that it's not only what you're sort of what you're feeling on the inside and what you're thinking in your mind, but it's also how you have seen your village, your city, your country, Sort of all these other sort of superstructural social um, divisions behave in response, right? So, um, as we say here, stigma sort of functions at this intersection of culture, power, and difference, where anybody that's different is seen to be stigmatized, and some people are stigmatized more than others, right? So this is the framework that we're working on. We sort of take this more anthropological approach that there are cultural factors that also affect and sort of lead to this stigma. But stigma itself usually doesn't have any evidence in the real world. Where do we see it? We see, we see evidence of stigma through discrimination, right? Fundamentally, a structural construct because it has to be something that happens in interaction with other people, in interaction with organizations, in interactions with sort of the world at large, right? And we argue that people that are stigmatized are more likely to report negative interactions with other people in their social networks, or more likely to feel that if they did disclose their HIV status, they would, right? So they're afraid to disclose because they're worried about response. 
right? So this is how we sort of operationalize this stigma and discrimination. We ask direct questions about, well, do you feel embarrassed that you're HIV positive? And we ask some, some sort of more psychological questions, but we also ask for what we would consider to be sort of direct behavioral outcomes of this disclosure or of this discrimination. So what do we know about the outcomes of stigma and discrimination relative to HIV? So obviously it's associated with the same sort of suite or syndrome of outcomes that we see associated with all kinds of other sort of chronic diseases. It can lead to depression, poor health related quality of life, increased HIV symptoms, and poor AR ART adherence. Right? So if we're thinking about building this conceptual model, what we would say is something along the lines of all this evidence or these measures of the stigma and discrimination are somehow negatively associated with our measures of HIV care, HIV care retention and adherence, right? This is the sort of the first step. I say the model part one, it's, it's sort of like a horror movie, it's gonna keep coming back. So be, be prepared. Um, so let's talk about disclosure, disclosure a little bit, right? So you can tell people that you're HIV positive or people can guess, right? So there's a variety of different frameworks that you can use for talking about HIV disclosure. Voluntary and involuntary, somebody could tell that you're HIV positive to your friends, right? Whether or not you wanted them to. Then there's sort of direct information, that's sort of communication between individuals, or this sort of proxy measure, which is somebody saw you taking your HIV medication, somebody saw you going to the clinic, right? That's a problem that we're dealing with now because what we're, at, what we're wanting to do for one of our studies is do alter follow-up. So we want to have people bring in their alters to talk to us. But the issue is that in rural areas, going to the HIV clinic, regardless of what you're going for, is a possible indication that you're HIV positive. Even if you're just going to give follow-up information for a study that's being fielded, right? Mm -hmm. So that can be problematic. Most of the studies only talk about direct disclosure. They only ask about direct disclosure. We don't get this detailed information about how did your friends find out that you were positive? Did they just guess on their own? Did they find out from other people? So one of the things that we're excited to be able to do with this new study that we're that we're fielding is to ask a lot more questions and a lot more detail about this disclosure, right? So why do people disclose this is getting back to your question. You know, people want to disclose because it's just such a burden sometimes to hold on to this information and not be able to talk to someone else about it, right? Um, you have to disclose in order to get treatment. You also sometimes have to disclose in order to have somebody there by your side to be able to help you get the transportation that you need, to help you get, help give you the money that you need, and so on and so forth, right? If you're pregnant, you probably are going to need to disclose at least to your doctor and to your family because you could be having an HIV positive child, right? There are a number of reasons, right? Um, ultimately, you would hope that you would disclose to your sex partners to protect them from from infection, though we know that that's not often, or not always the case. Right? Um, and, you know, people have experienced negative responses, so you disclose to individuals and then all of a sudden they choose not to interact with you anymore. This, we, we see this, the same sort of things happening in the developing world as we see happening in the, in the developed world when it comes to disclosure, right? Um, I, I have this bullet point down here that research shows that while fears of disclosure are legitimate, consequences are often less severe than anticipated. That could change depending on this legislation, right? I mean, ultimately. Um, but what qualitative studies have shown is that people were more scared of what would happen from disclosing than ultimately did happen in disclosing, right? So just to keep up with the with the sort of parallel structure. What are the health outcomes of disclosure? Again, disclosing is related to having safer sex, being more likely to go in for HIV testing, initiating and staying in HIV care, and we know that, and for increased adherence to ART, right? So this is one of the primary outcomes that we're gonna be looking at in the study, right? 
but ART users found it difficult to take their medicine on schedule if they hadn't disclosed at least on one person. Right? And in Uganda, it's actually required that you have a treatment buddy who is not HIV positive who can go with you to your, to your uh, doctor's appointments and who can sort of be there to support you. Right? So you have to disclose to at least one person. I mean it's required. If, if you want to get government-supported HIV medication, the requirement is that you have a treatment buddy that comes in with you so that there's somebody that can provide you with support whose health may not also be compromised by the same situation that you're going through. Now, is the intention that just that having that people have found that having a network of at least one percent of support makes a huge difference? Or is it um, just that they have uh, found that um, people that have a buddy have enough social censure that they will continue they are the, the treatment and they don't want people um, needing the treatment? I think it's I, I don't think that they're they're building it based on a lot of sort of network research. I think the idea is people that have a buddy are more likely to sort of stay in care, not because of any sort of network effects, but just because you've got somebody who's constantly reminding you, who's constantly providing you the support that you need to, to sort of keep you in going to care, right? So here's the second part of the model, right? So we know that disclosure is probably then positively associated with these measures of care retention and adherence that we're looking at. Um, so social support is another one of these features that we know is associated with these HIV care outcomes, right? Generally, people have measured social support in terms of the number of people who are available to provide you with a particular kind of resource or how close you feel to a person who could provide you with a particular kind of resource, right? Um, Kathy Sherborn, who's actually also at RAND, sort of has broken social support down into this sort of five features. Emotional support, instrumental support, that's like money, transportation, all the sort of tangible things that you need. Um, informational support, um, she, she cites appraisal support, which allows an individual to sort of get feedback from someone on like, how are they doing? You know, what do they look like from the outside? You know, how are they, how are they being considered by other people? And then this idea of companionship and leisure and recreational activities. Like, do you have somebody you can relax with? that you can sort of take a load off, right? And in general, these measures of support, like I said, um, cover, they're either those that elicit perceptions of social support, do you think you have somebody you can go to for all of these different things? Or they measure specifically the kind and amount of support that you get from these, from these people. Um, which one is most appropriate is debatable, so we're actually probably gonna build in multiple measures of of support into our study, right? So what are the health outcomes of social support? Obviously, we know that this social support buffers all these, buffers stress, um, it sort of helps you when you're depressed, feeling hopeless, et cetera, et cetera, right? And ultimately, these lead to better HIV care retention and adherence, just like we said, right? Quantitatively, we know that measures of social support are positively associated with these, with ART adherence. Right? So there's another piece to the model being added, right? So we've got social support positively associated with HIV care retention, care, care retention and adherence, right? The thing is though, we know that social support, disclosure, and stigma and discrimination are also related to each other, right? So there's all kinds of, this is lots of words, but basically what this ultimately is saying is that there's all kinds of qualitative research that shows that there are relationships between disclosure and support. We know that there's a positive relationship between HIV disclosure and increased levels of support. And that there's a negative relationship between disclosure and stigma, right? So the more you disclose, often the less stigma you feel and the less stigma is associated with, with your behaviors. And in an environment where stigma is high, you're gonna have less disclosure, right? So we have qualitative evidence of that and we also have quantitative evidence of that, right? right. Sorry, 
Social support is self-reported. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are your friends supportive or right. something like that? Exactly. Um, one of the things that we're going to add to our study is rather than just this general measure of support, tell me how many people you think would be able to give you a ride to the doctor. Or of your three best friends, how many of them would do that? When we do our network elicitation, we're going to say, will this person give you a ride? Right? So we'll be able to sort of more exactly measure the level of support across, across these different areas. But as a general measure of support, it's not purely their um, effective sense of that the person likes or respects them. It could just be people will do me favors or I know a lot of people. Or something. It's more of a, it's a measure of their network rather than their perception of their place in their network. Maybe that's the word. I'm confused. I'll figure it out. <laughs> well, I hope I can unconfuse you later on down the line. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll see what. So basically, what we've got here are what I was talking about before. We've got this relationship between disclosure, uh, stigma, and discrimination, and disclosure and social support. Right. But we know that there's something else going on because you don't disclose in a vacuum. You can't receive social support unless you're receiving it from people. You can't sort of experience discrimination unless you're experiencing experiencing it from within a particular social context, right? And we believe that the best way for us to understand and measure that social context is by looking at social networks, right? So the piece that we think has been missing mm -hmm. has been looking at how each of these individual, you know, everybody has been looking at sort of these relationships sort of in isolation from each other. So they're looking at disclosure and support, or they're looking at disclosure and discrimination, or they're looking at disclosure and, and HIV outcomes, or they're looking at support and HIV outcomes, or they're looking at, you know, but one at a time. And what we think is that sort of the nexus through which all of these mechanisms work are social networks, right? So we know that people have done tons of research about HIV risk and HIV transmission that have, been, that have investigated the role of networks, right? We've got tons of information, mostly about, uh, you know, male IDUs in the United States about how their networks affect HIV transmission, right? So I'm not going to go into all that stuff that's listed down here, right? Unfortunately, we don't know very much about how those networks affect care in the long term. We know a little bit, but not a lot. And what we do know is based on populations in America, we know nothing about what's going on in Africa, which ultimately is a very different social context. So I think this is going to get to yeah. your question in terms of delineating between what we see to be social networks versus social support, right? We envision social networks as, the, as sort of the structure through which people are able to access social support. And in that sense, while we do ask a general question about overall how do you feel in terms of you know, the, all of the people that you know, when we elicit alter characteristics in these networks, we're asking specifically, can this person take you to your doctor's appointment? Will this person take care of your children when you need to go to the doctor's appointment? Does this person give you information on HIV? So we're asking specific questions about specific alters in order to understand from, from each respondent's perspective where the social support is located in their networks. So we're asking generally, but we're also asking specifically. And the idea is that in, in, uh, in American studies of HIV and social support, what we find is that most people get their support from friends who are outside. You know, they're not getting most of their support from family members, right? And HIV positive individuals often report much more or many more friends in their network than family members. What we see in Uganda is very different from that. We see many, many, many more family members, sort of um, parallel family members. So you're seeing cousins and brothers and sisters providing this support rather than friends. And we don't know whether or not that's because we're not able to get a large enough slice of the networks 
that all we're getting is family because they have much larger families in general than Americans do, or whether or not this is just really the case. So. Lynn has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, it still is the case in the U.S. that um, the disproportionately there's um, individuals who are HIV positive who are men of sex with men, for example. And so oftentimes they may not have that many members who are friends, who are family members. Right. Who um, they may often be estranged. Mm -hmm. And so maybe part of the difference is that you have, uh, relatively speaking, a much smaller portion of individuals who are on the family. Right. And more individuals who are not. So you've got two kinds of stigma going on. You've got right. a stigma associated with sexual preference, and you've got a stigma associated with disease. Those no, are it's very true. different. No, that's yeah. true. I think you also have to think a lot about geographic proximity of life, right? And mm -hmm. and how in America people are much more likely to live in places that are removed from family members, whereas I'm not sure exactly how things are in Uganda, but I would imagine that proximity of family members is probably a little closer than it is in the US. No, it's true. Proximity probably does play a <coughs> large role. However, um, I think that's going to vary depending on the kind of support that you're looking for, right? So because, trans because transportation and communication is much easier here in the United States, it's not that difficult for me to reach out to someone by phone and get informational support or emotional support from them just as easily as someone from Uganda could reach out to someone more localized. So I think it's going to vary depending on the kind of support, but I think your point is well taken that there is probably something that has to do with geography in there. Um, so I think here your argument is um, personal social networks can be a potential mechanism to obtain social support. Um, and then so I wonder how stigma plays in this mechanism if, if you cannot justify the personal, the members in the people's um, the patients' uh, personal networks can be really efficient in terms of getting the social support, because Lynn mentioned, you know, you might also be stigmatized from your close ties, right? Mm -hmm. Your right. authors. So I guess for you to make a better argument, you have to also justify, it's not just about access, but also it can be effective and powerful mechanism. I mean, personal social media. Right, I think the idea is we're gonna, we're gonna look at how these networks change over time and how things like stigma and discrimination may then lead to the evolution of these personal networks into, into structures that are more capable of providing this support in the long term, right? So the idea is we know that people just entering care experience a drastic change in what their networks are gonna look like. It's just that, well, I, I should say we don't know, but we have this intuition that there's gonna be a big change in what's going on, right? They're gonna have to start disclosing at least to one person, and then ultimately that's probably gonna lead out to disclosure, either active or passive, through their networks, right? And that's going to mean some people are going to, some people are going to discriminate against them. Some people are going to provide support. We're wondering whether or not, over time, they lose the people who are discriminated against them, add more supportive individuals, and ultimately gain an equilibrium that's going to lead to better long-term care, right? So we're we're thinking of this. We're thinking of these personal networks not only as a source of support, but also as the location for the stigma and discrimination to sort of be um, experienced as well. If that makes any sense. Right? It's really complicated. Yeah. Regarding your last bullet point here, um, with uh, among researchers who work in social support and social networks, is there a consensus that sort of that ideal social support network would have both weak, diverse ties and strong ties? Is that? Yeah, I think that that's the idea. We think that it's not going to be, your network is not going to be, going to be composed, your, your sort of, if you want to think about it as your ideal personal network, is not going to be composed entirely of strong ties because what you're going to then have tons of redundancy in terms of your network. And while that could be useful for providing emotional support is probably not that great at providing instrumental support because if you're seeing lots of redundancy, you know, people that live all in the same household, if one of them doesn't have a car to get you to 
your, your appointment, or one of them doesn't, if the household doesn't have the money to get you to your appointment, then that's an entire group of individuals, right? So you're going to have to have some diversity out there in order to sort of achieve an effective balance, I think, in the long term. Right? So ultimately, we get this incredibly complicated system of relationships where we have social networks here in the middle, and we know that um, you know, the makeup of your network is probably going to affect whether or not you feel okay disclosing, and once you start disclosing, that's going to affect the makeup of your network, right? There's going to be this co-evolutionary relationship there. It's going to be the same sort of co-evolutionary network, uh, co-evolutionary relationship between social support and your network structure and composition, right? Same thing with stigma and discrimination. And ultimately, all of these things are going to lead down to your long-term care adherence and retention. Well, you have a, a negative relationship between stigma and discrimination and social networks, but wouldn't it be contingent upon the structure of social networks? I could have, you know, if you were you're, you're so jumping to my conclusion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> what I'm going to show you is that. Huh? Yeah. What I'm going to show you is that from some of the preliminary, preliminary stuff that we're finding, there are more likely differences that have to do with where people are in the care continuum and what their network composition looks like depend that are going to sort of make these negative relationships sort of vary in valence depending on what we see. So as I say before, I, we think that networks are the nexus of this, of this sort of group of conceptual ideas and these relationships that we're seeing, right? People commonly refer to social networks when they're discussing their findings, but they don't ever apply network methods in collecting the data and analyzing the data. They sort of use it as a metaphor, mm. but they don't actually sort of really get down into the methodology, right? And that's what we'd like to do. And we certainly know, we don't know of any study in Africa that's looking at this in this level of detail. Right? There are a few studies that we see in Tanzania, Botswana, um, some of the surrounding areas that are looking at qualitative studies or sort of mildly quantitative studies, but nothing that's looking at it in this level of detail. Right? So what we feel is that social support and stigma <coughs> represent both positive and negative aspects of social influence that arise from the same underlying mechanism, these social networks, right? And that decisions about disclosure are an individual's sort of opportunity to try and control that. It's like how they feel like they have some agency in what's going on. And ultimately, those play out in their health behaviors. So the final version of this conceptual model takes into account your point about where they are in the care continuum and a whole bunch of individual characteristics and sort of social network characteristics are related to what we know about stigma discrimination, disclosure, social support, and care retention and adherence, right? The disclosure box and the network box are darker because we feel like those are sort of the unique contributions of our study. We're asking about disclosure from uh, a much more sort of sophisticated way because we're asking about active and passive disclosure. I, I, uh, I just wonder if, you know, you talk about the Ugandan policy, mm -hmm. um, you know, where's the place for something like that in this model? And maybe it should be individual and community level characteristics. Right. Uh, I just feel like that is something, uh, policy and uh, community level norms that really influence all of these things. Certainly. And you know, I think that as we were developing this model, we never envisioned there would be a change so drastic that we would think that it would be able to affect this model. Because we really were considering this at the level of sort of individual social context. We never realized there was going to be a change so drastic that it might actually have an effect. But now we have to reconsider what that's going to do, right? Well, the other thing I would add to that would be uh, um, mass media and the, and the way that mass media messages are filtered into the individual probably are highly contingent on the network features. 
certainly, certainly true um, in people's sort of experience of stigma and discrimination. Like there's probably all kinds of stuff coming in from outside, whether or not it's government level policy, whether or not it's what the media are saying, all that kind of stuff that we should probably consider, whether or not it's how, I guess, how I should say we should put it into the study. Um, do you happen to know in Uganda what percentage of individuals, persons living with AIDS, are not, did not, or, uh, the disease was not transmitted uh, from one man to another? That uh, what I'm wondering is if you've got a situation in your model, just talking about stigma, um, and then what you mentioned in terms of policy has to do with men and sex with men. And what I don't understand is for men who are men, for others, were other than men and sex with men, uh, or that was the mode of transmission. What I, I don't have a sense of the stigma associated with the disease. You know, mm -hmm. what is the stigma associated with the disease if it's not if the transmission was not via a route? Right. Uh, I do not believe that um, that the general public is sophisticated enough to separate the stigma associated with homosexual transmission of HIV with stigma associated with the disease. I think still in Uganda, if you are HIV positive, even if you're a woman, somehow the idea is it's all wrapped up together in this sort of like blight of homosexuality that's on the that's on the population. And ultimately they're all sort of wrapped up one in the same. Is there data on that? Or? Uh, there are. Um, well, do you mean data on the demographics associated with the HIV positive population or data associated with whether or not people are perceiving a difference between yeah. um, the disease and, I don't know that anybody's done that study. I don't know that anybody knows whether or not they're considered separate or thought of separately. Because it, it seems like if there are different bases for stigma, right. then, then how that is addressed or how the network might respond to it might be very different. Right. No, it's true. So at the treatment facilities, do patients have access to counseling or advocacy services on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. And does that have a, a strong relationship with disclosure? Uh, yeah. What we know is that there's a positive relationship from people feeling like a clinic is a community, a place where they can get support, a place where they feel like they are supported inside the community. That's also related to disclosure. However, because this is, you know, we're building these things based on a cross-sectional study, we don't know whether or not they are, they feel that the clinic is a community, but the people that they're reporting they're, are all other clinic members who they've disclosed to, so they've already created a sort of safe environment that they can disclose to, or whether or not they begin to feel the clinic is a community and then ultimately start disclosing to other people outside, right? It's one of the things we want to investigate with this longitudinal study. Another question is, I know each of these African countries is a little bit different in terms of this, but what what is the um, underlying cultural model for, oftentimes when women are the ones who get HIV, they often get it from their husbands, but it's usually the women who are much more likely to be stigmatized. And so what's, what is the situation in this particular country in terms of uh, that kind of thing. Does the woman have any power? Does she, you know, are her relatives likely to abandon her? Are the children going to go to the husband? What, what's the dynamic mm -hmm. there? Uh, well, the children won't go to the husband. That's, it's not that kind of society. So the woman will still maintain control of her children, but, you know, she would be stigmatized. However, the man, the husband would be considered, I think, probably more um, culpable for the situation because the woman is considered to be you know, devout, you know, unlikely to leave the house and 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 have affairs with other with other men. It's more likely that the man is seen as the person who's going out and having these affairs and likely brought it home. The unfortunate thing, though, is that many of these men don't know their status. And then will basically um, refuse to be tested and, you know, deny that they are the vector of transmission inside the household. So it's this incredibly complicated situation because many of these people will never will deny that they have more than one wife. 
but they do. They have completely separate families. You know, sometimes three or four. But the party line is, no, we one man, one woman, good Christian values, and that's it. But the tribal, the tribal sort of establishment that allows for polygamy is maintained in the sort of cultural subjects. So, um, anyway, I know that we're running short on time, so. Um, we have some support from a preliminary study, and this is a study that we did, a pilot study that only has 39 participants. So what we were looking for were just trends in the data. We weren't looking for sort of strongly, statistically significant information. We just wanted to know whether or not the data that we had collected, because we were doing this for a separate study, were going to support this conceptual model. Right? Um, even gender distribution, um, pretty much even distribution across ART, so we have half on ART, half not on ART, and then among those that were on ART, uh, 10 who had just started and 10 who had been on for more than a year. Right? Cross-sectional personal network approach. Um, basically, this is um, in words what I'm going to show you in this picture right here, which is of what we found in our study, this is cross-sectional study, was support for all of these places where we had these green arrows. And you'll notice here how I have this positive negative because we have mixed relationships here. And we think this is because there's a lot more complications associated with who the individuals are, where they are in the care continuum, and what their personal network composition is. And what's the characteristic of the social networks that you're basing these correlations on? These are generally associated with measures of, of network um, cohesion. So we're looking at density, we're looking at number of isolates, we're looking at the size of the largest component in these networks. So we're just mostly looking at structural features here rather than compositional features. How did you measure stigma and discrimination? Uh, so this was a pilot study. There were only um, a few single item questions on this particular scale. So discrimination was measured as um, friends have stopped visiting, calling, and, and coming to me, coming around once they found out that I was HIV positive. And the uh, stigma was, I feel ashamed that I'm HIV positive, right? Social support, uh, I feel that I can rely on this person for tangible resources, or I feel I can rely on this person for uh, information or emotional support, and then there's a general measure that just says, I feel that the people that I know are supportive of me with respect to my HIV care. And disclosure was also just a single item, which was, do they know that I'm, do these people in my network know that I'm HIV positive? So the population is all HIV positive people, they may or may not have disclosed, and they may or at that, it's at the one point in time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The population is all HIV positive, half male, half female, and also half on ART, half not on ART. So the disclosure idea is, you know, you can have disclosed to any of 20 network members, right? So you have a sort of proportion of network members who know that you are positive or not, right? What's the range of the network size? Uh, the networks, everyone's social network was constrained to be 20, so that they were comparable. And this is sort of the standard approach for a personal network study. In order, you, you basically choose a network size that you feel like is going to allow you to get uh, the range of network features and the variance mm -hmm. across networks, and then you stay with that across all of the respondents so that all of the respondents' networks are comparable. Right. And uh, McCarty and Kilworth have shown that 20 generally is able to sort of capture most of the variants that you need in the network features that you'd be looking at, both composition and structure. Did I see other hands? And, and what about the composition of the network? Like, uh, I'm not sure about Uganda, but the general picture is that young males are dying out because the virus and the women are increasingly affected by virus. And mm -hmm. women, I mean, are, are caregivers by nature, so they might be a major risk for social support. And I'm wondering if the combination of stream network in terms of gender ratio or when parents were um, might be uh, 
might have this correlation mm -hmm. between the two. Well, we do know that there's no relationship, like most of these networks that we collected for these 35, 39 individuals were, were evenly balanced according to men and women. So we still had a good gender balance, right? And there was no relationship between people being on ART or not, or the amount of time that they were on ART or not with respect to the gender balance that we saw in them over time. That's probably just a feature of the people that we had in our study, right? Because it was only 40 people, right? What we're going to do, sort of inside and outside Compile, so we're going to do a study where we're looking at not 40, but 10 times as many, 400 participants, evenly balanced between men and women, and evenly divided by this word that ad health uses, urbanicity. I don't even know that it's a real word, but it means half of them are going to be from rural areas and half of them are going to be from urban areas. I have a non-research question. I'm just curious who funded this study and how do you expect to see it implemented? Uh, NIH is funding this study. And what do you mean, how do we see? How do we expect to see it implemented? Are you thinking how far will start to create educational programs that go out before people actually come to a clinic, or is it NGOs that you're going to expect to see using the research to create some sort of change, or is that not the point? Um, in the long run, what we imagine happening is the development of a series of interventions across this, you're, you're also getting to the end of the talk, um, interventions, some of which are associated with stigma and how to combat stigma within your network, some of which are associated with, with social support and how to activate social support within your network, and some of which are associated with how to make all of that stuff relate to care adherence. Okay. So we're going to do a longitudinal study, baseline six months, 12 months, and it's going to be personal networks using a software called EgoNet. Okay. I know that we're getting close to time, so I want to just get done. Um, in terms of the attitudes, obviously we're going to ask them about discrimination and stigma and community level support. Um, we're going to, in terms of care adherence, we're going to do chart abstraction and also ask them how well they're adhering to care. Um, we'd love to do, you know, something that gives us a little more detail in terms of actually how many pills they're taking and how often and when, but that's just not going to be possible. Um, they're going to do a personal network assessment where we're going to talk about all the different kinds of disclosure, all the different kinds of support, and all the different kinds of discrimination that can be sort of experienced. And then longitudinally, we're going to look at changes in all of these different things. So we want to see how their networks sort of finally achieve this equilibrium. Right? So what do we want for the outcomes? We want interventions that allow people to identify those who are probably likely to stigmatize them and come up with solutions for how to address it before it happens. Right? We, want to be, we want people to be able to identify who's going to be able to give them support and then help them come up with mechanisms for establishing sort of and standardizing the provision of that support. And what happens if who normally gives you a ride to your, to your appointment can't do it? Who's the person that's next on the list, right? And we want to understand these patterns of disclosure better so that we can think about what strategies tend to, tend to be more successful over time. I know that we have about four minutes before the talk is supposed to be over. I was going to show you some, we have a similar study that we were looking at depression here in the United States, and I was going to show you how the models compare, but I think I'll stop here and then see if anybody else has any other questions. Um, back to this definition of stigma. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just, so you said that it's how ashamed, whether or not you feel ashamed uh, that you have HIV. So to me, shame, shame is usually uh, an emotion that reflects the fact that you think that you've done something bad. Right, so, so this is an internalized stigma measure. Yeah. yeah. So it, it seems like, you know, you want to know whether or not you think that other people have thought that you've right. done something bad. So certainly, so certainly. that would be, you know, trying to figure out what the source of the stigmatized reaction is to right. you, rather than what the reaction ultimately is to whatever no, ab absolutely. So the pilot study, we only had a limited amount of time and a limited amount of space that we could put information in. So um, in the new study, we're going to put all of Seth Kalishman's stigma and internalized stigma scale questions in so that we know a lot more about what's going on. So you know, we had chosen 
you know, a single item that we felt like was most reflective of what we needed to get as quickly as possible for the pilot study. But for this larger study, we're going to ask in a lot more detail about, you know, all different kinds of stigma, stigma, stigma ideas and um, sort of experience of discrimination so that we know a lot more in, in a lot more detail. So your point is well taken. It also seems like it's part of the same thing as, you know, to what extent, what are your attributions about you know, why you got you contracted this disease and what is your responsibility? Mm -hmm. And yeah. other people's perceptions of these. Right. And those are there are questions on that same Kalishman scale that have to do with that, you know, is this a punishment? Is this you know, something I have to deal with because I brought it on myself. Like all those kinds of statements are actually in this in the scale that we'll be at, that we'll be using in the larger study. Benjamin, a uh, question just about um, this method compared to other um, more metaphoric uses of uh -huh. network approaches you were talking about. I'm I'm curious um, whether some of the qualitative methods I would assume can come up with some of the same general principles if they are in fact general. And I'm just imagining some of the advantage of a network approach is maybe you could start looking at bifurcations in the population and saying, oh, people that have this kind of network should be approached differently than people have this other kind of network. Right. And I'm just throwing something out there to kind of get at, are there things you think that this a more formal network approach is going to get at that you can't get at with some of the qualitative? And if so, is that because it's of a certain size? Is that really about when you think of this 400 that you're talking about that you're going to start to see some of these factors? Or is it kind of affirming the model in a more rigorous way? Uh, well, I think that the size will allow us to affirm the model in a more rigorous way, but it also allow us to look at sort of subdivisions within our respondents and sort of variation within these networks in a way that gives us more understanding of sort of the detail that, that we're going to be able to see. There's a difference between saying someone feels that they can get support from three of their network members and saying someone feels that they can get support from three female family members who are all connected to each other and in a component separate from everyone else, right? That level of detail is impossible to achieve with the standard measures of social support, right? But I think it becomes important when we are trying to understand the mechanisms by which people are achieving care adherence, right? So that's why we want more detail. You get to the last question. Last question? I'm, I'm looking at your study and wondering how you're going to recruit participants. Mm -hmm. from it, whether you're going to be able to get people who are, for example, HIV positive but have not gone to the clinic to get treatment and support. So where are you going to get this sometimes? Yeah, so they're going to have to all be enrolled in clinic care. Um, we're actually working with a partner called the Joint Clinical Research Committee who has who have clinics all throughout Uganda. So they will be helping us do our not only our data collection but also our recruitment. And what we've explained to them is that we want people across the board. So we want people who are just starting care. In general, most people that are that that come in to get tested are at a point in their health where they're going to go immediately into care. Whether or not that means they're starting ART at that point or whether or not they're just sort of gearing up for ART, they're still going to be going into long-term care. So we're going to try to get people from them, you know, some of them just coming in, right? And follow them over the course of a year. And we're also going to get try to get some people who have been in care for a longer period of time. We're not going to be able to get people who are not coming to the clinic. It's just going to be too hard. I imagine that will uh, sort of limit what you can find about stigma, too, because if there's enough stigma, they're not going to be selected. Exactly. Exactly. And that's one of the limitations that we have to say about every study is, you know, obviously this is a very specialized population that feels okay enough to come to the clinic to receive care. So we may find some, you know, we may have some issues that are associated with that, but we hope we hope we'll be able to see something about how it's operating. Very interesting. Okay. Very interesting. Yes, Helen, do you want? You will, we'll give you the last question after all. Thank you. Actually, I actually have two very specific questions. Oh, I'll make it very short. Sure. What is the analytical uh, analytical tool you're using to analyze your pilot, um, the data from your pilot study, Sienna? Oh, no, so we're not doing, because the way that these data are collected, um, the assumption is that every personal network that we elicit is, creates a profile of network structure and composition variables that's unique to each individual, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just like having a 
personality battery or uh, you know any other sort of psychological measure. They're independent. So we're just using regular oh, SPSS. But, but you're, you're also doing the over time analysis, right? Uh, now for your pilot, you're not tracking. It's only cross-sectional for the pilot. For the, for the new study, it's going to be longitudinal personal network study. We have a couple different ideas about how we're going to analyze it, one of which is creating a series of structurally blocked matrices inside of a regular sort of longitudinal network analysis so that we can use Sienna to estimate these changes that we're seeing. So you did get, you got both questions in after I don't know about interviews. Okay, uh, <laughs> you can ask him afterwards. Um, I'd like to mention that next week our, our speakers are Bob McChesney from the University of Illinois and John Nichols, who's a correspondent with The Nation and associate editor of the Capital Times. They're here to talk about their new book, which has just been published, entitled The Death and Life of American Journalism. So we look forward to seeing you all next week. And Hank, thanks very much for sharing. Oh, thank you.